Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I'm the coordinator of volunteers, public outreach, and programming at the museum. Thanks so much for joining us today. And thanks to those who have joined us for previous virtual <laughs> programs. Welcome back. Over the next couple weeks, museum staff and volunteers will be sharing programs featuring Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories of our collection that you can experience from the comfort of your home. You can see the full list of upcoming presentations on our website at patrolley.org, which I can share in the chat box in just a few minutes so you can click directly on it. Now, we have some viewers who have visited the museum before. We've got some volunteers here, but for those who might be new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. The museum opened to visitors a few years later in 1963 and is actually located along the route of the trolley line between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. You'll find almost 50 trolleys here and electric railway cars, about 20 of which operate, and about 30,000 people visit each year um, and take the four-mile scenic ride at the museum. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter, Dennis Kramer. Dennis has volunteered at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum for 26 years in both the operations and publications departments. Dennis has been kind enough to share several of his programs with us during the pandemic, so thank you, Dennis. And I'll give you a brief description of his program today. Armstrong County, Pennsylvania was home to two separate trolley lines during the first third of the 20th century. This program from Dennis will focus on one of them. The Catanning and Leechburg Railways Company, a small rural line, ran for 10 miles in the middle of Armstrong County from 1899 to 1936 that became part of the West Penn Railway System in 1911. The focus will be on the communities of Catanning and Ford City, along with a look at Lenape Park, an amusement park owned by the Railways Company. At the end of this presentation, we will have a question and answer session with our presenter, but the chat box will be open throughout the presentation. So please feel free to enter questions and comments during the show. And uh, Dennis can read through those at the end. I will invite everybody to unmute themselves at the end as well. But if you could for me, go ahead and turn off your video. Um, I will come along and turn off the videos that happen to still be on. So don't be offended. It's just so we can see Dennis's presentation. Um, so please keep those off throughout the show so that Dennis has all the bandwidth available. All right, Dennis, if you're ready, take it away. All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to a small town trolley along the Allegheny River. Uh, when most people think of small towns, they think of places like Washington or Johnstown, something like that. Those of us who live in really small towns, uh, I'm talking about the current population of the town of the borough of Catania is about 4,000 people. That's what we consider to be a small town. Uh, so that's what it looks like from the hillside. I don't live in town. I live about a mile from where I took this map shows the streetcar lines in western Pennsylvania. The lines in bold were owned by West Penn Railways. At the end of the 19th century, having a trolley line in your town was the equivalent of having an internet presence today. People all over the United States were investing in this transportation revolution that enabled our cities and towns to grow beyond their wildest dreams, in some cases. And like today, quick fortunes often disappeared. This has been the age of the horse and buggy. At the turn of the 20th century, there were only about 8,000 automobiles and 144 miles of paved roads outside of town in the entire country. There were no shopping malls, televisions, radios, airplanes, nor computers. Things were no different in Armstrong County, Pennsylvania. Imagine riding a trolley from East Brady to Catanning or from Catanning to Yatesboro to Indiana. The Ford City, Leechburg, New Kensington to Pittsburgh route was also very seriously discussed. Even though those lines were not built, it demonstrates how fast this new technology was changing the face of America. The Catanning Traction Company was chartered on July 15, 1890, but no activity took place until 1898 when the Catanning and Ford City Street Railway Company was formed. And you can see up here that the line is going to start in Cowan Shannock, and it comes down through Catanning, 
It's going to cross the railroad. We'll see all of this come down Market Street, down, go along Galt's Hill, and then the map continues over here, down through Manorville, in through Ford City, past Ford City High School, down past the Ford City Bridge, and then it's going to make a turn and go up to Lenape Park. The line was about 10 miles long. The first trip took place on July 3rd, 1899, and they never looked back. Within nine days, the little trolley company had carried over 14,000 passengers. By 1904, the Catanning and Leechburg Street Railway Company, the Catanning and Ford City Street Railway Company, and the Catanning and Mossgrove Street Railway Company were merged to form the Catanning and Leechburg Railways Company, and the line reached its full length. This image was taken along Johnston Avenue near the Brickyard, and car 116 was built in 1900. The tracks behind, up above, have absolutely nothing to do with the trolley line. That's from the Brickyard. So that car was built in 1900. We're going to try to make our way down the line from north to south. Uh, there are no old images of anything at this point in town for the most part other than the one taken at the brickyard. So we see one of the newer cars once West Penn came into existence with in Catanning. And this is on Orr Avenue near the current host company number four firehouse. And you can see the now and then comparisons. The Obviously, the the arch on this house is the same thing that is right here, and the phone poles are all still in the same place. The gas station isn't there any longer. The cars at the top left were built in 1901 for use in McKeesport. They were sent to Connellsville to be re re rebuilt for the K&L. The roofs were lowered in 1923 to fit under the railroad underpass at the south end of Catanning, and the axles were reduced by six inches to operate on the K&L standard gauge track. The cost for the company was over $7,000 for one of these cars to do the rebuild. That's close to over $96,000 today. Six of these cars were brought to the K&L, and that's what they look like down on the lower right. Car 220 just come out of the shops in Connellsville and is waiting to go north. The orange paint shows up differently because of the orthochromatic film of the day. It makes it look black. Our photographer, Mr. Gurley, waited for one of those cars to pass the same location on Orr Avenue. Most street railway tracks in the state of Pennsylvania use Pennsylvania broad gauge, which is five foot two and a half inches, such as Pittsburgh and Philadelphia still use that gauge. Catanning was standard gauge, which is four foot eight and a half. The trolley line came south through Wick City on Orr Avenue, which becomes Woodward Avenue into Catanning, and then turned west across the Allegheny Valley Railroad near the former site of the IUP branch campus. IUP is Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Trolley companies often built over or under steam railroads to avoid conflicts concerning right-of-way. The single truck car is northbound with the conductor on the rear platform. And in the lower right picture, you see the photograph taken a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is now a rails to trail that is eventually going to go from Pittsburgh to Buffalo, New York. The trolleys had a rather unpopular tracks at the least opportune moment. A friend of mine who grew up alongside the trestle told me of the entertaining evening he had one time when the trolley jumped the tracks at the top of the trestle and the local fire company seen here had to come and help all the passengers off the car. Uh, I'm sure the motorman had a long evening that night and you know and we wonder why did the steam railroads not want them to cross in direct that's the obvious reason and you can see you can see the top of the trestle back there you can see the top of the trestle. Uh, this map shows the trestle, the trolley trestle. This is Woodward Avenue, and it came down and it crossed over to North McCain Street. This is a view from the 1924 West Penn Magazine. It includes the trestle and a Pennsylvania Railroad passenger and freight train. Catanning had regular passenger train service until 1955 along the Pennsylvania Railroad. There were two different barns at this location, as shown in both of these plans. The old barn was replaced in 1912, the same year the company bought new hats for the men as Christmas gifts. The employees of traction companies were a proud lot, as evidenced by this company photo taken shortly after the opening of the Catanning car barn. Stiff white collar shirts, black jackets and vests with brass buttons, pocket watch, and a gleaming hat badge. Who could ask for more? 
This is the same location before the building of the cottages along North McCain Street and the cottages that are there now. So this is what it looked like originally. You can see these houses back here in the back if you see my cursor. Before they built the cottages, this is some of the houses are still there. And then this is what it looks like looking from the other corner. They built nice places for people to live. The K&L was purchased by West Penn Railways in 1911. Uh, the property that we're looking at was owned by West Penn until Indiana University acquired the buildings and land in the 1960s. No trace of the campus can be found there today. Moving on down, this is North McCain Street. There again on a now and then, although it's not exactly a brand new now car because I don't have that car anymore, but you can see the houses are still very, very similar along the way. The line continued south along North McCain Street, passing several variations of Catanning High School. This building appears in the 1897 Sandboard map, replacing one marked burned on an 1886 map. This building burned in 1918. Central Elementary, the building on the far left, was built in 1919 and burned in 1965. It was rebuilt. The high school building on the right burned in 1979. Apparently, people in Catania really don't care a whole lot for their schools. It was torn down and replaced by the building containing a gymnasium, music rooms, and shops. These buildings were all closed in June of 2015, the year that this image down here was taken. Both buildings were demolished in 2018, and the image down on the left-hand corner shows what it will look like now, what it looks like now, and they're planning on putting more cottages in there. In March 26, 1913, the flood from the Allegheny River reached North McCain Street in this view, looking up towards the high school. And we can see it. We can see a car up here. This is three blocks from the river. So Catanning had some issues with some flooding. Market Street was the main shopping district of the county seat. This view is looking towards the bridge. The car is about to turn right onto North McCain Street. North McCain Street was returned to a one-way, two-way street in 2015. This parse card view looks the opposite direction. It appears as though the car is headed for the bridge down here. And you can see our courthouse in the distance up above. The tracks toward the bridge were never used. This postcard shows you the switch towards South Jefferson Street. The current view is from 1999. Did you notice the lack of wires in the postcard views? Artists typically left out such distractions when creating these color images. This is a view of a parade that shows the trolley waiting to turn right onto Market Street from South Jefferson. The unused tracks to the bridge are clearly shown here. They're right down here. The tracks leading to the bridge were for an extension to Applewald, which is across the river, that was never built. They were removed in 1921 to, for the company to avoid paying $4,700 in paving costs. Most contracts with municipalities required the streetcar company to maintain the street between the rails and several feet to each side. That included cleaning snow. The K&L owned a snow sweeper very similar to this one pictured that was built by Brill. The company office was located on South Jefferson Street. The upper right image is from the West Plan Employee Magazine, and in it we see N.L. Schuster, B.C. Fair, William Miller, C.H. Schaefer, Tony Geiger, Edna Kiesling, and Ralph Zellifro. The other image was provided by a friend of mine, and it shows her grandmother, Ann Hetrick Livingood. The map is from 1919, and the little arrow points to where the trolley office was. The streetcar came down market on South Jefferson. Here in this circa 1940 image after the line was closed and the building as it appears in 1999. Spring floods were almost an annual occurrence in Catanning until the Kinzu Dam was completed in 1965. South Jefferson Street was the way out of the southern end of town until 1936. That part of town was occupied by the Catanning Steel and Iron Mill. This 1913 sandboard map shows the 
trolley lines unfortunately don't show up along Moose Sandburn. They came right along South Jefferson and went along here. And you're going to see a photograph showing that in just a second. Here we see the lower end of containing showing the mill. South Jefferson Street curving to the right to become Indiana Road, and the trolley line continued along Manorville Road. And this is the trolley line sneaking out right down here in the center of the picture. All of this is all gone today. None of that exists. Here's a view from a little farther up. This is called Galt's Hill. And so the trolley line came up on this roadway, and we can barely see the tracks here. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's too hard for me to get up in there today to try to take a photograph from that area. There was a second car barn at the north end of Manorville. Uh, West Penn Power maintains a substation there today. The newspaper tells the story of the trails of early engineering feats. On the first trip of the line on July 3rd, 1899, the car cautiously proceeded through the railroad underpass at the southern end of town. After clearing the underpass, they proceeded around Galt's Hill, stopping periodically to clear brush from the tracks. Upon arrival at J.T. Deemer's farm, they discovered a shed roof, and the corner of his barn obstructed the right-of-way. Clear thinking ahead. Saws made quick work of the buildings, and Dr. Deemer was invited along as a form of compensation. The return trip, by the way, was made without incident. The weekly pass would cost almost $17 today. That dollar pass. These cars are near the location of that other car barn in Garrett's Run. Notice the West Penn logo along the hillside, right over here. The logos of the the images of the two logos are taken from West Penn 832 in our collection. Our restoration experts were able to have the new one created by careful documentation of the original. The color is known as Omaha Orange. So as we move along. The car line traveled down 4th Avenue past Fort City High School. I took my very first lessons here in 1962 and was privileged to teach music to thousands of students from 1977 to 2008. Uh, one of our viewers, Don Bailey, did a student teaching here, but I'm not going to say the date that he did that. The building has been renovated several times and it was closed in 2015 when the second image was taken. In this image, the high school is still under construction. And the view is from 1909, and you can see the trolley car way off there in the distance. And the current view down here is showing the empty lot after the building was completely demolished. Third Street shopping district of this former mill town. The Pennsylvania Railroad Depot is at the west end of the street, and the trolley is traveling along 4th Avenue. You can just see him sticking his little nose out right over here. And this is the view today. Obviously, there's no longer a train station down there. The Park Hotel was located at the corner of 9th and 4th. The balcony was often used as a speaker's platform for political rallies. The trolley car is headed south. So we just go a little farther south, about a half a block, and we come to the park. There have been several different gazebos in town, and it's been a pleasure to be able to perform at those over the years. John B. Ford founded Fort City in 1887 to serve as the home for his glass factory. At one time, this was the largest plate glass factory in the world. This early view shows the trolley headed south, and this part of town was not yet developed when this image was taken. But none of this is there anymore. This picture was taken during the dedication of the, Fort City former, the former Fort City Bridge in 1915. We don't have a complete roster of every car, uh, because record keeping over the long term was not a priority. We do know that this car, number 23, was a 1900 product of the J.G. Brill Company of Philadelphia. These single truck cars were not known for their smooth ride, but they were certainly more comfortable than a horse and buggy. The street railway industry was the fourth largest industry in America at the turn of the century. By 1918, it had reached its zenith. Henry Ford's assembly line was having a very negative impact on trolley companies around the nation, and abandonment soon became the norm. This is the right-of-way along Tub Mill Run, where the line left the valley, headed for the hilltop. The car ad, which is tough to see here, is for a baseball game on October 3rd, 1906. 
We see the same car again, car 23, at Lenape Park Station with the same crew and child. People typically rode trolleys to work and shop. The companies needed to come up with a reason for people to ride on Sundays, so they built trolley parks. There were two in Armstrong County, uh, Lenape Park here and Allison Park between Apollo and Leechburg. A surviving example of a trolley park is Kennywood outside of Pittsburgh, built by the Mellon Street Railway Company. And if you have a real interest in trolley parks, we have a Zoom program, a tro another trolleyology coming up later in the month that will cover a lot of those. The company ran several ads in the local paper. And what I, always, what I really like about this is nothing objectionable will be permitted. So I'm not sure what people consider to be objectionable, but I can have some ideas. Cheer up, don't whine, don't groan. Visit Lenape Park. Lenape Park was the winning name selected for by a contest for by the railways company. Miss Elizabeth McConnell of Rosson submitted the name based upon the Indian definition of Lenape, which is people coming from the name Lenny Lenape or original people. The new trolley park was intended for the use of the people. The new park was opened in 1905 and regular service began shortly after. The fare was 10 cents for the city. On July 4, 1907, over 10,000 people attended the Independence Day festivities at Lenape Park, according to the newspaper. Operating crews spent over 20 hours in service, getting them all there and back home. Obviously, those little cars were overflowing with passengers the entire day. As time went on, the park became less popular, and in 1923, West Penn Railway sold the land surrounding the park. The trolley line was cut back to the southern end of Fort City in 1928. However, we do have some images from there. This is flat car L near the end of the line. The road you see going up here, this is now Church Road and heading up towards Appleby Manor Church. This company blueprint shows planned development in the area of Lenape Park that never came to fruition. This part of town exists, but here we see the trolley line coming up across here. None of this was ever built. This is all farmland here, and the vast majority of this. Some things were built here, but they look very different today than what this blueprint shows. This is a car at the end of the line. To change directions, the operator took his controls, fare box, and other materials from one end of the car to the other, and then swung the pole around. This crew has changed ends. You have, may have noticed that there are no headlights on these cars. Headlights were attached to the horizontal bracket in the evening, right here. And there was no need, the company felt no need to spend money running with the lights on during the daytime. That costs extra money. This early image was taken sometime between 1899 and 1904 when the company name was changed to the Catanning and Leechburg Railway Companies. And here we see Catanning and Four City Street Railway, the original of one of four names. This guy is Joe Southworth, and he was an operator for the company. Being a crew member was a well-respected and a clean job. Crews got to know all the riders, and everyone shared the news of the day on the way to and from work or shopping because you were riding with the same people every day. His son, Joe's son and daughter-in-law, graciously shared these images with me from the archives of the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. And his granddaughter, actually Joe's great-granddaughter, was a student of mine at Ford City. That's how we made the connection. So here we have... Joe, and this is Joe Jr. This is the grandfather that I was talking about who shared the images with me. Having their images shared for posterity. And here, over here, we see him sitting, sitting on the steps. Joe was the man who provided the images for the camera. And this is Joe. This is, this is, the grandfather, and it must have been a pretty cold day because he's pretty well dressed up. In this image, mom joins the family. This box over here on the pole is part of the West Penn signaling system that they used to protect cars traveling in opposite directions on single track. The cars had heat, and this is the only known interior photograph of a trolley on the Catanning and Leechburg Street Railways Company. They all seem to be having a good time here, posing for the photographer. 
The Johnson coin changer made life a lot easier when dealing with the public always seeming to be in a hurry. Hurry, And there, there's one right there, hanging off of his belt. I can tell you when they're full of cho change or tokens, they're pretty heavy. These guys are sitting on a lifesaver designed to scoop up errant pedestrians in the path of an oncoming trolley. It would pick you right up and save you from being run over. That's why it's called a lifesaver. The April 1925 West Penn News featured Joe Matthews as one of the company's safety men for his no-accident performance. Incentives and awards were offered as a means of protecting safety, and this is an example of one of their safety awards that's in my collection. A transfer from March 1903, the conductor made punches, and the punches were shaped in different styles to delineate who issued the transfer. An eight cent ticket in 1925 would cost about a dollar today. The dollar fifty weekly pass would be about twenty dollars today. Comparing that dollar weekly pass, uh, a single drone trip on the containing bus lines today is a dollar and a quarter. And as an exit from town over the railroad. And here we see we see the plans for it down here. Of uh, they want to bring the traffic off of South Jefferson down Walnut. For those of you who know town, Sheets is right here, and then we want to come over this way and come over top of the railroad and eliminate all this underneath here. Uh, it was going to cost the company over ninety thousand dollars to move the track. The company said no. They filed for abandonment, and the final run was on April eighth, nineteen thirty six. And here we see it at being advertised in the Valley Daily News in Toronto. The trolleys were taken back to Connellsville for possible future use, but the cars were never used again. West Penn Railways got out of the transportation business by 1952. So what's left to remind us of this little system? Different communities had different requirements when it came to removing abandoned tracks. Tracks still exist under 4th Avenue and Ford City, as these Im images from the intersection of 4th and 5th Avenue show in a 2014 photo. And if you drive down 4th Avenue, you can still feel the bump, the bump, the bump, because the tires are rotting away. South of that intersection, the line began to climb up the hill, and it made a sharp left-hand turn just before Tub Mill Run and continued up the hillside, providing many scenic views of the stream below. And you can see the right-of-way coming right along here, and then it makes a curve. Tub Mill Run is right over here. That's a little stream. The right-of-way is still there. The easiest way to find it is walk down the paved trail from Fort City and turn left before you cross Tub Mill Run. That's Larry Shedwick, a good friend of mine, leading the way. During the abandonment hearings of 1928, one of the reasons West Penn stayed to end service is that the ballast was in need of replacement. Well, this is what they use for ballast. It's called pot glass, and it's still there. It came from the glass factory. This is a view along Hobson Drive outside of Ford Cliff showing where the embankment, where the trolley line ran. And it came right across in front of the shed here. And then seeing here, it came out this alley, crossed over there, and came up into Tub Mill Run, and Lenape Park was up here. This highway was not here at that time. This is what the high, this is where the, it crossed the highway. If you're from, there's a billboard there, and you can still see the right of way as it curves around. Uh, the road wasn't built until after the park was gone. Car 117 was built by the St. Louis Car Company in 1900. The ad in the car is from Labor Day Grand Celebration at Lenape Park. Now I can tell you we mentioned earlier that they carried 10,000 people for a July 4th facility. I've been involved in activities, public public performances in Armstrong County since about 1967. I've never seen 10,000 people at any event here. To give you an idea of the size of our county, there are about 65,000 people that live here today. Presentations such as this are not possible without the generos generosity of collectors and organizations dedicated to preserving the past. I would like to thank you for, to enter for participating this evening. I'm going to send it back to Kristen. If you are interested in more, the Trolley Museum does have a book. I published, they published this in 19, or 
in the year 2000 so it's 20 years ago already but we still have some copies so you can either contact them or contact me so I'm going to turn it back to Kristen and we're going to open some things for some public comment and questions Excellent. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, I have shared uh, a slide here of our upcoming programs, but before we talk about those, I do want to mention uh, that Dennis uh, has more material that hopefully we will be able to see in a future presentation. Isn't that right, Dennis? Yes, I have material on the Leechburg and Apollo line. Excellent. So, um, to be continued, we will say. And please feel free to turn on your videos now. Um, and we'll go ahead and unmute in just a couple minutes. But like I said, first I wanna talk to everybody about what is coming up soon at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. This Friday, as part of our special fall theme Fridays, we'll host a program called Car Card, Streetcar Advertisements presented by our educator and research librarian. And next week on October 13th, we'll get back to trolleyology with a Johnstown show from Jim Grabener focusing on the end of service there. And links to sign up for these are now on our website and I will post those in the chat uh, right now. So you can click on those if you'd like. And if you have any questions for Dennis, feel free to type them in the chat box if you don't wanna unmute yourself. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for uh, bearing with us through the um, technical difficulty there. And we did get a comment, Dennis, that um, the sound was a little, um, what do you call it, garbled now and then. And I heard that too, so it might have been the internet connection, like starting to go south. So if anyone had a question about something that Dennis said in a particular slide, let us know. And um, perhaps we can even go back to that. Right, um, right. So speaking of those fun fall Fridays at PTM, you can actually join us in person for some special themed tours. On October 16th, we'll have Yinzer Trolleys, Transit of Western PA. And on October 30th, we'll have Off the Rails, the fascinating second lives of our collection post abandonment. And then, like I mentioned before, we'll have some digital presentations. Uh, the Car Cards one this Friday. And on Friday, October 23rd, as Dennis mentioned, we'll have Lost Trolley Parks of Western PA. And then on uh, Halloween, we'll actually have some harvest trolley tours, some for adults and some for kids and some activity packets to go along with that. Um, thank you so much everybody for coming today. Um, if you did enjoy the program, uh, you're able to make a donation if you'd like at patrolley.org slash support. And I can send uh, a link to this in the chat as well. You can support us in other ways. You can become a member or a volunteer. And I know a lot of you guys are members or volunteers. So thank you for that. And thank you to those who did make donations when they registered for the program today. We truly appreciate that. And it helps us uh, keep continuing these virtual programs. All right, so let me let everybody unmute here. Allow participants to unmute themselves. Okay, so if you'd like, you should be able to unmute yourself now if you have a question or a comment for Dennis. And I know a lot of people are gonna ask if they can watch this later. Um, I will try to make an edited version that you can watch on the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum YouTube that should be up within the next couple weeks or so. So stay tuned, I'm still working on the one from last week, um, but that should be up very shortly. All right, uh, I am opening the floor for any questions or comments. Well, I actually have a question for Fred Cosgrove from Sterling Heights. He has a question about a Monroeville slide. He can either type or talk. Oh, uh, well, it was the uh, first slide presented after we lost your internet connection there, and you didn't say anything about it. So I was wondering if it was a station stop there or what. Was a no, that was a, that was a gas station, and it's Manorville. So that's that's where you got confused. Manorville, okay. Manorville, okay. Yes, that was that was a gas station along there. Okay, neat looking building. Yes, and it's like I said, it's still there. It's yeah. it's amazing. Sometimes Thank you. places don't change. Uh, yeah. When I when I do the presentation on Apollo, what really is you really notice is downtown Apollo changed completely. Mm. They, they did one of those modernization programs, I think, that they regretted later. Oh. Very interesting, Dennis. Great lullaby. I enjoyed it. Um, 
By the way, you talked about the hinterland. The last program, uh, I'm in I'm in urban area and I lost the internet, so we lost our internet for <laughs> the storm. So I missed the whole Char Charleroi uh, trip. Mm. Yeah. Hey Dennis, can you hear me? Yes, George. Um, I I did type this in, but I'll ask you. Uh, you had mentioned they rebuilt cars in Connellsville. What did they do? There wasn't a track connection all the way up. How did they get the cars up there then? They probably brought them by railroad. Uh, a, a track connection wouldn't have worked anyways because <laughs> the cars were originally were broad gauge and in Catanning they were standard gauge. Mm. So I'm assuming they brought them by railroad. Because you know, like you say, in that time period, they wouldn't have had trucks big enough, I don't think, to carry something like that. And so I'm assuming they brought them up on the railroad. Great presentation. Thank you. One thing that I didn't know was that they used glass as ballast. That You wouldn't want to walk on that, I'm guessing. It, it's not glass. What that came from, most people have seen images or movies of a steel mill in Pittsburgh of how they poured these giant cauldrons and they poured steel. That's exactly the same way they pour glass. I was lucky enough... I moved to Ford City on the 100th anniversary of the town, and part of the festivities was a tour of the entire factory when it was still going full blast. And you saw these cauldrons that you could easily put someone's house inside. Well, every once in a while, they pour and they pour, the glass starts to line the sides of the cauldron. And so what they have to do is they have to shut that, that whole facility down let it cool, and then the lowest paid workers were the ones who had to climb in there and beat at the sides with sledgehammers. And so the, the photograph you saw, the stuff that looks like my, my two, two of my best friends from Fort City were science teachers, and students would always come in and say, look, look, Mr. Shedrick, we found some crystals out, out <laughs> along the highway. You know, and it's like, no, you didn't find crystals. But that's what it looks like. Uh, I have a couple pieces of it, and I have a spike from from over there but that's where it came and like i said the lowest paid people had to had that wonderful job of going in there because you know they never let things cool down so it was actually cool it would have been blisteringly hot wow and uh, we did have a comment that the car cards presentation is not on the trolleyology page that's because it's actually um, a separate series so um, on friday october 9th and friday october 23rd the car cards presentation and the lost trolley parks presentation are actually um, a separate uh, kind of fall themed fridays uh, so how does one sign up for them uh, there is a link in the chat so i'll send it again yeah, it's please. also on it's also on the main Pennsylvania trolley webpage. So um, if you go and click on the link that says fall at PTM or fall Fridays at PTM, uh, you can see a link to sign up for those. And I also just shared it in the chat there. Uh, the registration okay. process is the same for the trolleyology and for the other virtual presentations. Uh, they're just we had already planned our trolleyologies out for the month when those virtual presentations came up. So uh, we didn't include them under the trolleyology name, but they're almost the same thing. So uh, feel free to join for those. They're still about Pennsylvania transit history and streetcar history. So those are going to be really good. And if you joined us back in June for the Western Pennsylvania Trolley Meet virtual edition, you might have already seen the Lost Trolley Parks of Western PA presentation from Jennifer Sopko. Uh, it's really good and I encourage everybody to sign up. You'll learn a lot about amusement parks and um, general history about the area. All right, so back to questions for Dennis's presentation. Sorry about that. Can I talk? Does anyone have any other questions or comments for Dennis? Were, were the buses, were the trolley replaced by um, West Penn buses? No, no. Private bus company, a private bus company took over. Oh, okay. And it lasted here until about oh, the early 1970s. And then we had no bus service for a long time until Pennsylvania started funding bus services again through the um, lottery. Hmm. 
And even where I live today, when in 1963, I had bus service here. I still don't have bus service today where I live. Mm. And so as I get older, that's going to become more of a, more of an issue. But I can still drive. So in State College, the substation for West Penn has the emblem on it in brass plaque. But instead of where it says railways, it says transportation. They may have changed that through the years. Yeah, I, I assume that meant buses. Yes, they, they had a bus company, Penn Transit. Yeah. Huh. All right, any more questions or comments for Dennis? I think um, that was a really neat presentation because it's, I mean, even if you've lived in Pittsburgh your whole life, you might not have gotten all the way up to Catanning and, and the Valley up there and the um, Armstrong County. So uh, thank you, Dennis. Well, a lot of anyone that's on the screen that's been an operator has sent mail to Catanning for probably 10 or 15 years. And if you've never been here, I invite you to come up. The leaves are start, just starting to turn. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a neat place to visit, more or less. <laughs> There's not a whole lot here to do. I mean, there are no movie theaters in Armstrong County. Uh, if you like coffee, there are no uh, Starbucks in Armstrong County. Sorry about that. You know, that stuff doesn't exist up here. But it's it's been a nice place. I've called it home for 58 years. And... It's, it's, it was a nice place to be raised. It, it really was. Um, it, it was a little bigger then. When I was in high school, Catanning probably had eight or 9,000, maybe 10,000 people, and now it's, it's dropped quite significantly. This area has never recovered from the economic downturns of the 1970s. Like I said, that, that PPG plant employed thousands and thousands of people alone, and right next to it was an Elger Pottery factory that employed probably close to a thousand people, and those jobs are all gone. Uh, the, the only, the only well-paying jobs here are either being an attorney, being a teacher, or being a doctor. Mm. That is not uh, most of the coal mining there's still a little bit of mining left, but not much. Catani's not the only place that the uh, jobs disappeared. Right, right, right. It's it's been difficult, but uh, it's okay. Like I said, it's 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 a nice, quiet. It doesn't cost. There's no, the cost of living's not real high. Uh, it's relatively safe. Don Bailey, I assume you recognize the high school. Sure did. And I was kind enough. I, I and to be perfectly honest, I don't remember the year, but I know that you student taught there and lived in the house next door. Uh, From the fire station. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dennis. Good program. You're welcome, Joe. Nice to see you all. I can see I can see about eight or nine of you right now. So. <laughs> If you unshared your screen, you'd be able to see more of us, Dennis. I don't think I'm sharing my screen anymore. All right. Well, then maybe Kristen is sharing it. All there right. We, we should ah, there we go. Brady yeah. Bunch style now. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, does anyone have any more comments or questions for Dennis while we're still here? Well, the other thing you get from living out in the country is so-so internet. <laughs> well, my internet company is my phone company. Uh huh. And, and so I, I have a, I have a six, I have a six meg line that comes in. I mean, most of the time it works. My wife, since the pandemic started, my wife has been teaching Zoom piano lessons, <laughs> and so the piano is sitting right beside me. Uh, we don't want, obviously, we don't want children coming into the house. There's nothing wrong with the children. It's just we're trying to be safe as we can. Uh, you know, we both have several underlying conditions. But the piano is the piano is right beside me over here, and my model railroad is actually behind me. But the lights are dimmed. Kristen says she thought it looked very ethereal this way. So, <laughs> <laughs> you just see this floating head. <laughs> And no, I'm not wearing pants. 
Uh, we didn't want to know that. Time to go. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, <laughs> I want to thank everybody again for joining us today. And thanks for joining us uh, for all of our trolleyologies, if you've been tuning in. And thanks so much to Dennis for sharing. If you have an idea for trolleyology or if you think you'd enjoy giving a program, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, my email address is in the confirmation email that you got when you registered. And um, if you got the reminder email today, it's also in there. It's assistant at patrolley.org or volunteer at patrolley.org. I'll get email at both of those addresses. Um, and again, the links to the upcoming talks are posted on our website. And we hope you guys can join us in the coming weeks. I'm already starting to think about the next season of trolleyology, which will probably be in January and February. So again, if you're interested in presenting, please let me know. Thanks again, Dennis. Thanks again, everybody for coming. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Dennis. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Chris. Good to see you, everybody. Yep.